welcome to Tech Talk. I'm your host, Seth Miller, and we're talking antenna options today with FinCom CTO Bill Milroy. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. We're talking about antenna options today, now and in the future. And as we dive into this, can we talk a little bit about what the different choices are for antennas, what the different technologies are in service today? Sure. Speaking generically, there's really three different types of antennas that are either on or soon to be on planes. So the first one's the gimbaled antenna, which most people understand what that is. So it's on a two-axis gimbal, it's, a, it's a, some sort of rectangular shaped antenna under a radome, goes back and forth, could be a three-axis at some point. The second part is a, a phased array or a, a, an electronically scanned phased array. So these are phased arrays that have all electronics, so there's no moving parts in them. And then the third type would be a VIX phased array. So it's in the phased array class, it's just a different type of approach, does the same thing, moves the beam around, but generally when you look at it, you don't see anything moving. All right, so phased array, electronically steered phased array, the VIX, what does the phrase phased array really mean? What's that technology? Sure, so phased array would generally imply necessarily low profile. Mm -hmm. It also means it's this magic kind of antenna the class where you look at it and the beam is moving around without actually moving any of the parts that you can, that you can see on the antenna. Then the other type would be the uh, uh, electronically scanned arrays. There's an active electronically scanned array which has uh, active elements, uh, little LNAs, HPAs, the transmitters behind each element. Okay. And there's passive examples, which actually are more like the gimbal antennas. They have a separate transmitter, what you would call a transmitter, and they have a separate low noise amplifier on the receive side. Awesome. And so as we're working with these sort of phased array types antennas and getting into what value they bring to the industry, can you talk a little bit about what some of the advantages are versus a gimbaled antenna? Sure. Well, one, one that's an obvious one is their lower profile. So that's good for uh, fuel consumption, lower drag. Maybe less obvious is that uh, in terms of bird strike, and every radome has to be bird strike approved, and higher ones as well, and they can be approved, but it's much easier when the profile is low. Another benefit that they have, though, is also at lower latitudes, which would be higher elevation angles, uh, there's an issue called skew angle. And the gimbaled antennas in particular can suffer from the skew angle, and all that really means is lower efficiency, less bit per hertz, or if you're the guy paying for the bandwidth, more transponder bandwidth to get the same data rate to the user. So obviously there's a lot of advantages they bring, but there's the counter question to that. What are some of the shortcomings that uh, phased array solutions have? Sure, well it is a double-edged sword. So uh, phased arrays in general, because they work well at the lower latitudes, higher elevation angles near the equator, they suffer what's called gain loss as they go to higher latitudes, lower elevation uh, on the satellite. Now some have a problem getting past about 30 degree elevation angle, which can limit the latitude to work out, but some work at 10 degrees, even eight degree elevation angle. Uh, so that's uh, one particular issue. And then in terms of cost, cost is a, is a separate issue, particularly for the electronically scanned arrays. The phased array solutions aren't new technology. They've been around for a while in various implementations. Mm -hmm. Why are we still talking about it? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The phased arrays have been around for maybe 30 years. I used to actually work on phased arrays okay. in my previous job. And originally th those were devised for fighter aircraft. And those are systems that can really exploit the fact that the beam needs to move quickly so you can look at different targets back and forth. Maybe not that important, one might argue, for tracking a single satellite. But the big issue there was, you know, this is a many, many millions of dollar system going down to a few million dollar system. And when you get to a few million dollar system, lo, lo and behold, you can go on an F-18 or an F-15. And so I think one of the challenges is, in terms of their deployment is cost, but I want to point out it's more than just cost, mm -hmm. it's heat and all the other items that are part of it. But certainly I think cost is one of the key items. Okay. So given all these challenges, the pros and the cons, when you start talking to an airline or a manufacturer about sort of picking the right solution for their airplane, mm -hmm. uh, what are the key factors that you consider? Sure. Speaking generically, so meaning all of all antenna types, so we already talked about profile as being mm -hmm. an issue, but tunable bandwidth. By this I mean how wide a bandwidth you can work. And, and it used to be that you just needed 500 megahertz and that was good enough to work in a regional area. But as we move to more global systems, planes that can roam and go anywhere in the world, the, those are now moving from 2000 megahertz, maybe even to 3500 megahertz in terms of the tunable bandwidth that you need. But the other really, really important part is the channel bandwidth. By that I mean, the, what's the maximum bandwidth that any one plane can use, the transponder size? And again, that used to be 36 megahertz, and that's an important metric because that is going to be one of the things that could limit your throughput to the plane. And, and that's moving now to 72 megahertz, 125, 250, 500, particularly as we go to HTS satellites. And so not all antennas can handle that much bandwidth, so that's another important consideration. A third consideration would be beam agility. So again, it used to be that you could be relatively slow. And to tell you the truth, on a commercial plane that's at cruise, and the satellite that's fixed in the sky, you, you don't need a whole lot of agility to make that work. You like to have a little more agility for beam pointing and so on and so forth. But now, in particular, as we move to LEO and MEO satellites, those are satellites that move across the sky, some fast, some slow, you have to track them, but 
you don't want to forget. Also, when they set, you need to move the beam over to the other satellite. So now that's pushing what used to be maybe 10 or 15 degrees per second used to be okay. Now it's where people are talking 400 degrees per second, 1,000 degrees per second, even more. And that's become a really important uh, consideration. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us here on Tech Talk. Stay tuned for our next episode coming soon.